Hi, everyone. My name is Adam Birkenstock. I am the Director of Programming at the Long Island Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence. I am here today to talk to you about a really important topic that we call compassion fatigue. So compassion fatigue may be a term you know about. It may not be a term that you have heard of before, uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about what it means, what defines compassion fatigue, a brief webinar today that I hope that you both enjoy and get something from and that you learn a little bit from. So let's get started. I like to start talking about compassion fatigue with this quote because I think it really exemplifies what many of us go through. Whatever our profession, whatever our experience, whoever or whatever we're dealing with, I think we can relate to this. The expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. Whether you're a social worker or a nurse or a doctor, a firefighter, EMT, a mother, a grocery store clerk, whoever you are going through the COVID-19 crisis right now, you are immersed in suffering and loss daily. When we turn on the news, sometimes when we're going to work, we are experiencing the suffering of other people. We are seeing that people are passing away. We are seeing that people are struggling with what's going on in the world around us. So it's important that we recognize that as much as we might not want to be affected by it, we are being affected by it. It is something that is coming into contact with us, and so we are coming into contact with it. And when things like that happen, we're going to be affected. When it's part of our job, or when it's just a part of our life, we can experience two key factors, which are stress and burnout. When it's part of our work, we can experience that on multiple levels, it's physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion. And when we have these over a long period of time, which this kind of a crisis has been over a long period of time, and sometimes our job comes along with that kind of thing, so maybe we were experiencing burnout before this, we begin to question sometimes the value of what we're doing. Are we having an impact? Is what I am doing actually helping people? And we may question our competence. Am I really helping? Am I doing a good enough job? Maybe other people are, but am I doing a good enough job? And those are those scary kind of thoughts that eke into our brains and make us think, I need to leave this job. I need to leave this profession. But there's a reason we got into this work, right? Or there's a reason that we do what we do. This can also, during a time like this, I've heard this from so many people around me, make us question, am I a good enough mom? Am I a good enough friend? Am I a good enough son? it really gets into our minds. It becomes an insidious thought. And so compassion fatigue is an important thing for us to discuss. Burnout is something I think we've heard of, right? It's something that we're really familiar with, but it's important that we break it down. It is a feeling of exhaustion. It's a feeling of being overwhelmed and like nothing that we're going to do is gonna make it better. So it's different from regular stress, which is important. And then there's secondary traumatic stress. So if you're in the medical field, we're talking about a different trauma than physical or medical trauma. We're talking about psychological trauma. Although it can come from viewing medical trauma, it can come viewing death, come from viewing um, physical injury. Secondary traumatic stress happens when you are seeing other people go through a trauma, and that may be the immediate trauma of pain and loss, or it can be the ongoing trauma of watching people struggle to not connect in social isolation, the ongoing struggle of people losing their businesses, things like that, although hopefully we won't be watching it for too, too long. Secondary traumatic stress means I'm watching someone else's trauma and it's impacting me. I'm taking it on as my own. And so it's like I'm experiencing the trauma that someone else is experiencing. To give you an example, it would be like hearing a friend or hearing someone describe a car accident or witnessing a car accident and then being afraid to drive my own car. It may seem kind of reasonable, but if a month or two down the line, I'm still really afraid to drive my car or I get really anxious and nervous, I'm kind of riding the brake at that point, then I could call that secondary traumatic stress. That would be me responding to a trauma that isn't mine, that I didn't go through, that my brain should be reacting to in this way, as though it were my own stress and trauma. With burnout, 
what we want to really remember is that the stress that we're experiencing day to day right now is maybe not normal. It's normal to experience stress. A little bit of stress is healthy. If I'm experiencing no stress, I'm sleeping, which is maybe a reason that we're not sleeping that well right now because we're experiencing a lot more than usual. But when we have stress, it's a response to our environment. There's a demand on us and we want to meet that demand. And my friend asks me to make them, or I guess I should say my roommate asks me to make them lunch and I make them lunch. There's a little stress, there's pressure on me. I meet that pressure, all good. It's not a huge stress on me, that's okay. If I am under the kind of stress where I wanna go see my family and I'm not able to see my family and that stress mounts and mounts and mounts and mounts and mounts over time, I may be at a seven out of 10 for days and days and days and days. Or if I have a high pressure job, I'm anxious about getting sick at my work as a checkout person for days and days and days on end, I'm feeling fatigue, that stress is burnout. I'm overwhelmed. And that's not just in my mind, that's in my body too. Our body experiences stress, it's releasing cortisol, epinephrine, my muscles are tensed, I'm breathing differently, I'm ready to fight, I'm ready to flee, I'm ready to freeze, even though none of those things are necessarily going to help me in the kind of stress that I'm dealing with. And so the stress that I'm experiencing isn't just a state of mind, but it's a state of body too. And so we start to have things like you know, muscle fatigue, soreness, we start to have um, fatigue, we start to get sleepy, we get a tense jaw, we maybe are really irritable around people, or we're really clingy, and then we push them away, we start to really change, we shift in response to stress. And that's what burnout is, it's being overwhelmed for a period of time. And we can see that compassion fatigue can be a result of intense workload demands that are happening now, intense time pressures, and then sometimes a lack of control when we're feeling that in our work. That can happen because of what's happening now, but that can also happen because of what's going on in our work in general. So we may be experiencing this beforehand too. So I mentioned this before, some stress is okay and healthy and normal, but in burnout, we're getting that physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion. So if you're feeling a constant stress that even your regular coping isn't helped to go away, um, it's not helping it to go away, or if because of a situation like what's going on now with the COVID-19 virus, you're experiencing increased levels of stress in a constant way, we might start to feel really burnt out. And so it's just important to monitor, do I have normal levels of stress? Am I between a four and a six and maybe below that and I'm feeling okay and I'm able to get enough sleep and take care of myself? Or am I experiencing high amounts of stress, moderate to high amounts of stress frequently enough that my body and my social relationships are really suffering from this? We want to really take, a, take stock of our stress. The signs and symptoms of compassion fatigue will probably sound kind of familiar. We might be tired and exhausted. Maybe that's from sleep. And we might be getting enough sleep or we might be getting more sleep than usual, but maybe we don't feel that we're getting enough rest. We could feel like a failure or like we're not doing our job well enough. And that could be the role that we have as a person, or that could be the job that we're doing. We could feel really frustrated, really irritated, like our fuse is really short. And we could also feel disconnected from people. This is something that I think can be a really insidious thought. So I'd like to describe it this way. When we are feeling, and this is another symptom, depressed, we might feel this way too. We can get it into our minds that anyone who understands what we're going through already knows what we're feeling. So I don't need to talk to them about it. They get it. And if I'm talking to them, I'm going to bring them down. They can't really tell me anything I don't already know. And if somebody doesn't understand what I'm going through, then they're not going to get it. What are they going to be able to tell me? So I'm not going to tell them what's going on. And we kind of trick ourselves. This is this thought pattern that comes up in burnout and stress with depression, where we end up isolating ourselves because we convince ourselves that people either get it or they don't get it. And I shouldn't talk to any of them. And that's really just a deception we play on ourselves, that if we talk to people who do understand, they can help us. And if we talk to people who we think don't understand, we may be surprised or they may be able to offer us a new perspective. 
we might also feel like we need to turn to unhealthy coping like alcohol or, or substances to kind of get out of our minds. Um, we might feel really wary of situations like that trauma is going to come up. It can be really common right now to feel like when you go outside, your, your breathing might be labored or you might be nervous about uh, situations you weren't nervous about before and taking on other people's trauma that is your own. So this is what I like to call uh, Instagram therapy, where we see kind of a little image and it's wonderful and it's super sweet. You cannot drink from an empty cup. And I think we can agree on that, right? We can't drink from an empty cup. If we're pouring ourselves out for others, if we're pouring ourselves out for a situation or if things are draining us, we really can't be there for ourselves or um, we're not full enough to continue to pour ourselves out for others. That's wonderful. But what this doesn't do or what these images don't do for us, even though it can be nice to follow them and see them on our feed, um, it doesn't really tell us how to refill. So that's what I want to take a little bit of time to do today. We want to think about the different areas of our wellness. And this is one way to think about it. We can talk about our spirit, our mind, and our body. So starting on the bottom right with our mind, our mind is kind of everything up here. It's our, our brain, physically our brain, and it's also the way that we think, it's the perspectives that we take, and it's the way that we engage our, um, our mental faculties. So to take care of our mind, there's lots of things we can do. We can engage in certain hobbies like reading, we can play certain games, um, things like Sudoku come up a lot, puzzles come up a lot. Um, I always like to say that there's, you can see there too, there's blending between different areas. So yoga is one of those things that can actually blend between all areas, meditation too sometimes. Um, one that comes up sometimes people say, oh, I really like playing Candy Crush. And so I always ask them, so do you play Candy Crush? And then do you think about every move? Are you getting feedback from the game? Do you know what's going on every moment? Do you feel really engaged in everything that's going on? Do you not feel like you lose time? Do you feel really present? Do you feel every emotion? Do you fear it's the ups and downs of life with it? Because if not, you're not really actively engaging in the process. It's something that's a, a distraction for you. So I, I like to ask people, think of Netflix if you watch TV. When you're watching the show, do you feel taken out of your life to an experience you're fully engaged in, where you're wondering what's going on for the characters, you're exploring what's going on, you feel pulled along in the story, you feel like really you want to know what's happening, um, but you can disengage from it to be able to sleep, take care of your body and, and other things, or do you watch it and then suddenly it's, you know, you're on the 12th episode of Millionaire Matchmaker and you don't know what day it is. Because one of those, that latter one is a distraction, the original one is maybe a way to engage our mind in a healthy way. In taking care of our body, we can do things like eating healthily, whatever that means for us, nourishing ourselves. We can exercise, taking walks, getting fresh air right now. Um, we can also do things right now like washing our hands, but also being combining body and mind, paying attention to valuable information, knowing that washing our hand takes about 20 seconds. And then once it's done, we are okay. We have washed our hands. We have done everything that we can to keep ourselves safe. We are wearing our mask properly. We're keeping ourselves as safe as we can. There's nothing more I can do at this point in finding a sense of acceptance. Um, sometimes different exercise works for different people. Uh, with our body, we may also want to kind of keep a good sleep schedule as well. That can be really important. And sleep hygiene can include things like creating a ritual around bedtime, saying at a certain point, I am going to um, start to get ready for bed. I'm going to make a little bit of herbal tea for myself. I am going to make my bed for bed, or I'm going to unmake my bed for bed. I'm going to turn off the TV. I'm going to start reading. Eight people have a, maybe up to an hour of bedtime ritual that gets them ready for sleep and calm down. That can be a really great thing to take care of your body. And then in spirit, the reason I like to use the term spirit is that people tend to get tripped up by words like spirituality. Um, we've got preconceived notions. So this can be things like spirituality. It can be things like religion. Uh, it can be all sorts of things. This can 
be something like your faith, what you turn to when you're not really sure what the answer is. You can turn to things like spirit when you are seeking answers, when you're seeking stability, when you run across a question like, um, I'm not really sure how to get through not knowing. Um, these can be classically, these are questions like, what happens when we die? Or um, how do I find security and solace in a situation where I don't know when the world is reopening again? For some people, it's things like their religion, their faith. It can be things like yoga practice or mindfulness. It can be nature. It can be science. It can be saying, I'm going to follow the information. And sometimes the information is, I don't know yet. But that's okay. And I'm okay with not knowing yet. So that practice of acceptance of having as much information as is available, and then saying, that's okay, I know what I can know, and I feel comforted by that, whatever provides you with that sense of comfort. Some other coping strategies that I think are important to keep in mind to help build our sense of resilience are self-expression as one category, so painting, journaling, engaging with music in any way, something that helps us get into our emotional mind, anything that helps us to create, kind of get past our, our logical brain, confiding in other people, talking to friends or engaging with a therapist. Um, many therapists, almost all therapists are using some sort of telehealth platform. We've since day one been using telehealth actually for eight years now. So that's something we've been doing for a long time. Um, mindfulness, so things like meditation and mindful eating. Uh, which is a really fun practice. There's actually something called the uh, a mindful eating practice by John Kabat-Zinn that uses a raisin, which is a fun way to do mindfulness if you don't want to focus on your breathing. And I actually have a guided meditation I can run us through if you guys want to stick around for that. So I'm going to do that in just a moment. Then Zen Tangles, which I'm going to talk about, which is a creative way to do mindfulness. And digital downtime. So especially in a technological world like we have right now and where we're really connected to our phones and our computers, dedicating a space to hold your technology. So I keep my computer in one room, even though it's a laptop. And when the laptop is there, it's for work. If I move the laptop elsewhere, then it's for a game or it's for TV. Um, otherwise, I keep it there. When I'm out of this room, I'm not doing work. And then staying active, exercising, sports, doing yoga. There's lots of great opportunities through uh, things like Hulu and, and other opportunities to do even exercise classes online in your home. So Zen tangles are really fun. There is, this is a mindful practice. And any mindful practice is really the idea of engaging our attention, which may be redirected by anxiety or worry or some other thought or feeling. And redirecting it to something else. So the way that we do it is, and this is really great when we aren't really so into other mindfulness things or we're having trouble redirecting our attention for some reason. It's hard to sit and just focus. We don't wanna sit still. We wanna put our energy into something rather than sit passively. What we do, if you can see me on the screen, I'm actually going to go back to full screen for a moment and then I'll share again. So we might start with a shape. So I'm going to start with, a, start with a square. And then we can divide it up whatever way we want. There's no wrong way to do it. So I'm going to divide this in half, do it evenly on one side. And then I'm going to do kind of a squiggly line on the other. So what we do then from here is you fill in each separate space so you can see I have some little ones, some big ones. You fill them in with different patterns. And the idea is you're taking a little bit of time and what you're focusing on instead of your breathing or instead of uh, like a guided imagery, which is kind of like a, a medium step. It's also really good for people who aren't so into the mindfulness thing, but need an opportunity to get out of their head or to find some sense of calm. You're focusing just on the process of creating a design. So do a little fish scale design in here. And it's a way to just kind of focus in on the process of that. And this is something you can even do during a meeting or, you know, while you're watching TV, while you're doing something else, just to focus in 
on that feeling, that calming feeling. This is one of the reasons why those mindful coloring books are really popular. Focusing that creative energy can be a really wonderful, wonderful outlet. So those are Zen tangles. So I mentioned before that some basic things and what resilience really means is anything that that builds our sense that we can get through this, that we can do this, anything that builds our ability to deal with challenging situations. So regular physical activity, nutrition, active relaxation, and adequate sleep are important. These are things like making connections with people, maintaining those connections, especially in a time like this. Um, accepting that change is a part of life, practicing a, a, a mindset of acceptance, setting goals and setting new goals in a time like this. If there's things that we have an opportunity to work on, seeing these as a positive opportunity. So shifting kind of our negative internal dialogue into maybe a positive one. Looking for opportunities for self-discovery. So this is a great time. Sometimes people are really stressed at being stuck with themselves right now, but to think, okay, I'm with me. What can I learn about myself right now? Um, what can I do to take some positive time with me? How can I keep some good perspective? How can I maintain a hopeful outlook and take care of myself? So I want to take a second to do a little bit of mindfulness with you with a guided imagery. Um, hopefully you guys have a little bit of time. You can stick around with me. It's very short. Um, what I like about guided imagery, again, is that instead of asking you to just sit there and breathe, it asks you to just kind of listen to what I'm describing, to imagine it in whatever way works for you. Some people are good with having images in their minds. It can just be the impression or the thought. You can let me paint the picture. And just allow it to sort of guide a process of thought and a process of a series of states of mind for you. And instead of having to sit there and go through, well, I have a thought, I'm going back to my breathing. I have a thought going back to my breathing. This can guide a more creative process for your brain. So I am going to read this guided imagery for you. It will at one point say you can close your eyes. You can either do that now or wait for me to say it in a guided imagery. This is one I actually wrote myself a few years ago. So I invite you to join me in this process. It'll just take a few moments. This is called uh, a bubble on the ocean. When discomfort arises or when anxious thoughts predominate, you may feel drawn into the storm of worrying. Thoughts may come like waves that crash down on you, even as you reach for them to swim onwards. You may find it difficult or frightening not to attach or to swim. Notice any discomfort that you feel now. Allow your attention to wander around your body, noting sensations that arise in response to discomfort. You may notice anxiety or worry. You may notice an itch or an ache in your neck or back. Whatever the discomfort is, just notice for now how it feels and how you want to respond to it. In stormy water, we are driven to exert ourselves in search of calmer waters, the eye of the storm. With worry, fear, anxiety, or doubt, we are driven to find answers, a reason or solution that may end our worry. If we tire in swimming, we sink. And in overthinking, we may fall into depression. Close your eyes if you're comfortable doing so and bring your attention to your natural breathing. Rest there a moment. Find where it is most noticeable and rest your attention there like an anchor. Feel the in and out movement of the air at your nostrils or perhaps feel the expanding of your lungs or the flow of cool and warm air. Wherever your attention rests most easily, dwell there with your breath as your anchor. And with your anchor set, imagine yourself resting in a sturdy glass sphere on the ocean, rested on cushions and always right side up with plenty of air. As you rest there on the big blue-green ocean, a storm is rolling in. Choppy waves are stirred up by the wind 
and spray batters the glass, which holds strong as ever. The sphere bobs up and down, tossed by growing waves. The sun vanishes behind gray clouds. Now, breathing naturally and focusing on your anchor, see the sphere sinking beneath stormy waves, deliberately and under your will. The deeper you get, the less the ocean currents toss and shift you until soon you are drifting straight down, untouched by the storm. You are safe. Looking up, you see the waves continuing to crash above you, but here you are safe. In this place, focus on a feeling of peace and calm as you breathe. If you are drawn away to the storm by worry, anxiety, or doubt, Simply use your breath as an anchor to return to the feeling of calm. See if you can envision the scene and the calm that surrounds you in the bubble, safe and secure. In this space, imagine you are breathing in calmness, love, and acceptance. Imagine you are breathing out anger, discomfort, and sorrow. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Feel these positive feelings begin to flow in through your breath and negative feelings out into the sea where they can flow away. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. With acceptance and love, breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. And as you breathe, feel this calmness, love, and acceptance flow into your being, entering with your breath and flowing to your fingertips, down your legs and to your toes. Notice the positive feelings in your body and embrace them. As you breathe out, Notice where your body may be holding on to some pain or anxiety or anger or hurt and allow it to flow out with your breath and float away. Breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. You may again find yourself attaching to thoughts, holding on to pain and worry and fear. With kindness for yourself, Allow these thoughts to float away on your breath. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. And above you, notice that the sun has returned and the ocean is once again calm. The storm has passed. Your anchor can retract. And now gently allow yourself to float up to the surface. On the way, a gentle pressure may begin to lift. Breathing in and out, see if you can allow that outflow of pressure to unburden you, leaving you lighter of worry and anxiety and anger. As you break the surface now and feel the warm sun, take a few moments to breathe and notice how sensations in your mind and body have shifted on your journey. And when you are ready, you can open your eyes and return to the room. So this is an example of a guided meditation that I use to introduce the idea of meditation to people. I think it can be a helpful process to get away from the rigors of worry and stress and day to day and take a little time for yourself that doesn't mean distraction, but it really means cluing in to how things can be painful and distressing, but that it's okay, that that's a part of life and we can allow those things to exist within us and to freely leave, to freely be there and then to freely go and to continue on our day, to build the resilience, to hold on to the positive, to allow the negative to go and we can use mindfulness processes, whether it's a guided meditation, Zen tangles, 
uh, eating meditations, general meditations, whatever they may be to, to do that. What we're really doing ultimately is trying to rebuild our sense of compassion, satisfaction, the things that bring us joy to really sit with those. And during meditations, we can also focus on those. Remember the positive things about the work that you do, the relationships you have with family members where you may be feeling that you're not fulfilling your duties, but really remember what you love about these relationships. You know that passion drew you to these relationships, that passion drew you to these, uh, these jobs, this work, uh, this field, um, these loves that we have, and really settle with those thoughts and those feelings. It's a source of strength and fulfillment for us. And really that sense of compassion, satis compassion satisfaction is associated with a competence, a sense of competence, a sense of confidence, and makes us feel empowered, makes us feel that we can get through times of, of crisis and stress. So I hope you've enjoyed this time we've spent together. Um, we are gonna talk more about topics like this in the future. We talk about things like resilience, stress management. Um, if you need additional support, if you need to talk to anybody, we are here. We have a hotline, 631-979-1700. We also offer telehealth services that are low cost and sometimes free. Um, no one's ever refused services based on ability to pay. So just know that we are here for you and I hope that you've enjoyed this time with us. Please take care and we'll see you again. Thank you.